Run it up, then run it back. Run it up, then run it back. Run it up. Good morning run and welcome to, to Run It, it Back. Yeah, this is yeah. FanDuel TV. I am joined by my friends. We're all in cold places and I'm obsessed with weather. Uh, stadium Insider, Sham Sharani, right there in the middle. Lou Will from the ATL on the end there. Chandler Parsons may or may not be joining us from a golf course somewhere in Orlando <laughs> this morning. We'll hear from him in a bit, but <laughs> Shams, let's just jump right in. I, I, the Pascal Siakam, we talk about it. We wait for it. You had some news last night. What's the latest? Bruce Brown Jr. and three first-round draft picks. They've been back and forth, particularly over the last several days in these talks. And Indiana, I'm told, is starting to reach their threshold in negotiations and, and the, 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 the Raptors have been engaged with several teams. We've talked about the Kings, who appear out for now. We've talked about the, the Warriors, the Mavericks. They both had, I'm told, exploratory interests. And the Pacers have gone pretty far along yeah. in these conversations with the Raptors. Siakam is a pending free agent, $38 million expiring contract. And that gives him some leverage in terms of where could he end up and, and him signaling to a team that wants to trade for him whether he's going to resign there or not, that's going to play a big part in these trade conversations that the Raptors are going to have, that Siakam could have behind the scenes. And if a team knows that, that he's going to be willing to sign there, then you, you, you give the assets necessary, like this deal. Three first-round draft picks. The Pacers, I'm told, do not want to trade Benedict Matherin or Jairus Walker in this deal. That's why you see these three first-round draft picks. They feel pretty strongly, I'm told, about trying to re-sign Siakam as a free agent, and that plays a part in this pretty significant offer. They're going to continue to be aggressive, but still, there's no deal yet, and Siakam is at the top of their list. Could they move on to a guy like Jeremy Grant if this deal does not happen, and who potentially trumps this offer that has been made by Indiana? February 8th is a trade deadline. This is where talks stand right now. Uh, Indiana is very much pushing and motivated to get a deal done. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here, Lou. Um, I think the Siakam... Whether or not he wants to sign an extension anywhere is is huge. But let's just start with the three first round picks. Is that a steep price, do you think, Lou? Yeah, that's a lot, you know, cause considering you don't know what the future is gonna be for this guy, but you know, Indiana's showing its hand. They're telling you that we're ready to we're ready to compete right now. We feel like this is a guy that's gonna get us over the hump, and so we don't really care what's in the future or what or things to come. They're trying to load this team up for a deep playoff run. And Pascal Siakam, he's one of those players that can fit in a lot of different systems. He's a hybrid. You know, you can fit him on any team in the league. He's going to make a positive impact. So I think this is a great look for them. You know, they have a guy in, um, in Jalen Smith that's at, that's at 10 points and five, 10, 10 and 5 right now. You bring Siakam to that, you get 22 and 5. And you also get a guy that can play fast, play up-tempo like Indiana likes to play and on top of that, have a defensive presence. And so I think Indiana recognizes that and they're willing to take that sacrifice and draft picks and give themselves an opportunity to go get them. So Shams, the whole idea that he, that Indiana feels confident in the fact that they would get him to sign an extension, that sounds very optimistic, but what do we know about Pascal Siakam's ideas on this? Is he, is he intent on testing free agency or is there a, a choice here that he could actually make to stay with the Pacers if it happens? Where, wherever he goes, there's not a max extension, the full-term max extension that he's even going to be able to sign. So anywhere he goes, he can't just sign the extension immediately. There was a deadline for that uh, at the end of uh, December, where if he was traded before the end of December, he was eligible to sign a full-length max extension. And that deadline came and went. And now wherever he goes, it's really just going to be about feel. It's going to be about how he acclimates to whatever city uh, he, he gets traded to. So let's say this deal, you know, if, it, whether it's Indiana, whether it's Sacramento, wherever, it's going to be about feel. It's going to be about how the player uh, is in that environment. Obviously, the Pacers have to feel a certain type of way about Tyrese Halliburton, about how, how they feel their situation will be, how they can win with him in the lineup for them to be going these lengths to be motivated enough to offer three first-round picks along with Bruce Brown Jr. And Bruce Brown Jr. is an interesting player because the Raptors, they could keep him but they could also find a suitor for him at the deadline where that'll net you either first or, or a boatload of second-round picks. So 
The Raptors could be looking at this deal. If this is the route they go, you get the three firsts from Indiana, you get either another first from Bruce Brown, or you get a bunch of seconds. So the, the Raptors have avenues. Now, could they be waiting to see, does a, does a team come between now and February 8th and beat this offer? I'm sure that is all part of Toronto's mindset. Okay. Uh, Halliburton and Siakam. Do you love that, Lou? Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> you know, individually, I like <laughs> I like both of these guys' games individually. I, I like to see how it plays out, you know. But like I said, P Pascal Siakam is one of those guys that Tyrese can throw that ball ahead to him in the transition, and he can attack that rim or give him an option in a pick and roll, pick and pop, low post, mid post. He's going to have one of those guys with him that's going to be able to give them a lot of different looks offensively. And so I'm, I'm excited to see what happens. I'm excited to see what happens, too, right now uh, with technology and Chandler on a golf course somewhere in Orlando. Uh, Chandler. <laughs> oh, my God. No, absolutely oh, not. Oh, wow. If there yeah. was Check ever a picture out. of Chandler that made sense, <laughs> this is it. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm sure you could hear everything. Shaw says, what are you doing? <laughs> First of all, it's freezing in Orlando. I, I wasn't supposed to, We're going to warm you up. To, I wasn't supposed to play today. This is pro and before the tournament. I got the hand warmers in my pockets. This is dedication, guys. I couldn't miss the show for a thing. Hey, way, to be the, way to be a pro, Chandler. Way to be a pro. Way to be a pro. Make you're it work. Pro. Drew, way to be a for pro. For the record, you're in the warmest not, place of the four of us. I'm, for the record. I'm not drinking. I'm not drinking a Bloody Mary. You are. <laughs> oh God! Fine. Let's get your opinion now before you are gone. Um, Siakam to Indiana. Do you love it? I don't love it. I like it. I think Indiana is now is in a situation where they can they can compete. They can. They have a star player in Tyrese Halliburton to only give up Bruce Brown and future picks. Three first round picks is a little steep to me, but. You put Siakam on that team with Buddy, with Miles, with Tyrese. Now you're looking at a team that can be a tough out in the playoffs. And we all know how strong the, the Eastern Conference top teams are with Boston and Milwaukee. And Philly looks really good. But I like this for the future. Uh, it's a little unsettling if he's going to resign there. What's his price going to be? Uh, I do like it. I like it for this season. I think that that puts them kind of right there in that four or five seed after those top three teams. And, and – and again, they're going to be a tough out come, come playoff time with Tyrese, with now Siakam and a Rick Carlisle offense. I, I do like it this year. It just depends on kind of what the future looks like and how many picks they actually have to give up. All right. Well, your signal is, is beautiful. It's almost like the satellite is right in front of you. Uh, good luck with your tournament today. I see a lot of houses back there, windows and pools to be broken. <laughs> Hopefully we see you tomorrow, sir. Stay warm. <laughs> Hit them straight. Um, we got games, y'all. Thanks, we guys. Got games. Yeah, of course. Thank you. He's such a pro. I, I would never. Uh, Nuggets Sixers <laughs> last night. This this was a fun one to watch. It was the the battle of the big dudes, Jokic versus Embiid. I would say it delivered, and I would say Embiid came out on top on this one. Not only did they win, but his numbers were incredible. The 126, 121 victory. Embiid, Maxi, and Tobias Harris combined for 90 of their points and Embiid himself had 41 7 and 10 guys um it's one of the best games to watch so far I was worried that somebody was going to sit beforehand but we got it who wins the series if this were to actually be our finals Lou you know this is going to be a funny answer but strictly based on last night I would say the Sixers man Joel Embiid was absolutely dominant Tobias Harris was great for them, throwing in another 25 points. Maxi throwing in 26. You know, these guys were these guys were rolling. They look they look they look good. It looked like they were up for the challenge. But if you're asking me about a seven game series, I'm going with the defending champions. I like the way that they share the basketball. They can plug guys into that system. They play well together. That ball is moving. You know, this the the thing that we're gonna talk about is Jokic only having three assists, right? So if your center who's your best passer as well, only has three assists, that's going to affect the, the, the ball game tremendously. And I thought that's what we saw last night. He wasn't allowed to be in the passing lanes and get the ball out to those guys like they wanted. But give a lot of credit to the Sixers, man. They played a, a hell of a game, and Joel Embiid was the head of that snake. But if you're asking me for seven games, hmm. give me Denver again. 
I want to ask because, you know, when, when we've seen these guys match up, Embiid has gotten some flack for, quote-unquote, ducking a couple of the matchups. But then you watch a game like last night, and you're like, why would this dude ever duck anything, Lou? I mean, I mean, he was incredible to watch yeah. last night. Are, are we making too much of that? That's a, that's a, that's a silly narrative. You know, <laughs> let's, let's, let's go way back and do a deep dive into, you know, his injury history. You know, this guy has been a part of low management just as much as any other guys that we talk about when it comes to when it comes to load management, you know, he's had some situations where he's needed to take games off. And it, listen, if he's going to take games off and come in and give me two back to back 40s, then take another night off, big fella. So that's a <laughs> silly narrative that he's ducking anybody, ducking any smoke. If you to know Joel Embiid is to know that he's an extremely competitive person and he wants all the smoke. Trust me, he ain't ducking nothing. Michelle, 18th straight. 30-point game or more for Joel Embiid. Sixth longest streak in NBA history. He has been absolutely dominant, and every single game that goes by, it's like, it's so easy. I think Kevin Durant tweeted the other day, like, it took him three quarters to score 40 points the other night. It, it's just, what, what he's doing right now is, is, is super impressive, and he's only building upon what he did last year. He won MVP last year, and you have to give the Sixers a lot of credit. They're well-balanced. Tyrese Max last night, 25 points. Tobias Harris, 24 points. And uh, this team has a, a wide range of score, scoring ability. You have Marcus Morris playing at a good level. Kelly Oubre uh, chipped in with 11 points. And we know Embiid's the dominant force, but around him, he's got guys playing at a high level too. Tyrese Max, he should be an all-star this year. Um, and when I talked to people around that Sixers organization last night, getting a sense of, like, what is Joel Embiid's mindset, uh, you know, during that game? Is he talking trash about Jokic? Is he, like, what, what is his frame of mind? They say, honestly, he's quiet, he's focused, and his biggest things are pointers he has to make. Like, if he wants a guy cutting to the basket, if he wants um, more pick and rolls, if he wants the team to make adjustments, he's going to speak about that. But other than that, he's focused on the game. And, uh, I think Joel Embiid is just maturing year after year after year. Tyrese Maxey told me when he came in as a rookie, Joel Embiid wouldn't even speak. And now Joel Embiid, his wow. leadership and what he brings to the table as a professional, uh, as a leader, I think it, it means a lot to that organization. The idea that, I, that he wasn't even speaking is funny. There was a moment last night after the game, right after the game, with uh, Jokic and Embiid talking to each other, covering their mouths the whole nine. And then he was asked about it afterwards. He said, MB did, that he was telling Jokic, you know, you're the best player in the league, defending champs, yada, yada. Um, and then, of course, they cut to Shaq, and he's like, I don't know about that. So, Lou, I ask you, who is the most dominant big man in the league? You got you to gotta, you gotta put that down the middle 50-50. Their impacts are completely different. You know, Joel Embiid is a score-first guy. I feel like Jokic is a pass-first guy that can also score, you know. And so they give you two completely different dynamics. If I got the first pick at the park and both of those guys are there, I can close my eyes and pick one. You know, it's really that, it's really that close to me. <laughs> How they impact the game, the way that they impact their teams, it's completely different, but it's dominant. Both are dominant at the same time. So... I can't, I can't call it. Joel Embiid is in a league of his own right now with the streak that he's on, but we've also seen the same type of production from Jokic as well. And so I, I, I honestly can't call it. I like both of these guys. Normally I would give you a hard time, but I actually think this is the right answer on this one. It's too, it's too tough. They're tied. Um, I, well, you know, I, maybe this is negative. I don't know. But he does lead the league, Joel Embiid does, as far as free throw attempts. I think he's averaging like 12. He had 15 last night. And opposing coaches aren't always pleased with that, Lou. Are they right? No, tell guys stop fouling. <laughs> <laughs> you know, tell guys stop hacking. Because, you know, in my, in my career, I was a high free throw guy. I, I would pump, pump fake, get guys in the air. Or if your hand, your hand is out, I'm swinging through and I'm creating that contact because by the time I come into the game, nine times out of ten, our team is already in the bonus. And Joel Embiid, he's learned, he's learned that part of the game. Get you two easy free throws, take the pressure off your offense, go back down the court and set up, you know. And he's, like we said, we talk about his dominance. This guy, can, he can face up at the three-point line. You have to respect him shooting a three. So he can get you with a head fake at the top of the key put the ball on the floor. A lot of fives not used to a five putting the ball on the floor. That's, that's when you get in foul trouble when you start using your hands. When you post up, he's a seven foot, 200 some pound guy that can really run through your chest and go lay the ball up. You have to guard that. 
So that gives you a, that gives you another opportunity. He can play with his back to the basket. That's another opportunity to create fouls. And so give the man credit. He's doing a great job of putting a lot of pressure on defenses every single possession. So do coaches, are, is it annoying for a coach? Absolutely. But again, you got to have a, a better game plan for a guy that's going to give you four or five different looks to score the basketball. All right. I just have Chomps. to add. I just, I, yeah. I, I, I have to add, Michelle. Uh, you know, speaking about Lou, I follow Lou's career pretty heavily. There was only two players that got the calls that that he got. Him and James Harden. Lou, how did you do it? I, I just, <laughs> I, I've never asked you this question. You were drawing these yes. crazy fouls. So it was James. You and James were the only guys on the perimeter drawing these fouls. How, like I don't, I didn't even understand it. Yeah, because I, I, I think James and I, we were going into a lot of situations during games where we were just strictly looking for free throws. Like I said, if I'm coming off the bench and the first time I'm getting in a game and it's with three or four minutes left in that first quarter, the best thing that I can do to get myself going is to get a couple free throws before we start. So as soon as I grab the ball, I'm looking at what you're doing, whether your hand is out, whether you're a little jumpy or whatever. So I'm giving you a pump fake. If you go ahead and jump, I'm going to lean in. If your hand is out, I'm swinging through and I'm going to get two, two easy free throws. But it was the gift and the curse. You know, James and I, we did it so well that they changed the rules because of us. You know, so that's how we were able to do it. It's just playing chess in the middle of the games, giving yourself an opportunity to get two easy points before the game gets going. Well, Lou, let me follow that I up with, did you like liked you guys that much. I was going to say, I did, the rest loved you. And did you like <laughs> pissing everyone else off? Because that's what it sounds like to me. Yeah, I, I remember one game in particular. I think it was on the Spurs scouting report. Um, and this is one of the games that I started. On the very first possession, I get a guy in the air, pump fake, three, uh, three free throws. <gasps> Pop pulls him immediately and he rails him. And I told you to stay down on pump fakes. So these, you know, so trust me, these things are points of emphasis when it comes to game planning for teams. And so should teams be mad at Joel and B for drawing fouls? No, they should be mad at their guys for going for it. But it's so tempting to, you're moving. I have to, oh God, whatever. All right. Um, it is. It it's, is. It's just, it's like, ugh. Front court depth, sham, shams, shams. Almost called you shams. What am I, a stranger? Um, we're three weeks away from the trade deadline. Are, are we thinking? And there are so many teams that we're going to be looking at, and I'm so excited for this deadline this year. But is Philly going to be active? Are you expecting anything? I, I think they're going to be measured. I mean, th the one thing that they have going for them is they have these salaries like Marcus Morris and Robert Covington that are really in that range of, of it's not a major salary. You're not going to be bringing back a max contract type of guy, but you're going to be bringing in a, a you know, you could be in the market to bring back a, a really good bench piece, a really good score. Um, I, I think they're going to be active. I, I, I don't get the sense that they're as engaged right now on DeJounte Murray or Zach Levine or Pascal Siakam. I think those three guys, I, I have not gotten the sense that they are going to pursue those three uh, aggressively. I think there is a level of interest there for them, but not, not an aggressive pursuit. And so, this is a team also, Michelle. They have max salary space in the summer. So if, if you want to go and commit yourself to a Zach Levine or DeJounte Murray, you remove yourself from the free agency conversation in the offseason. And they already have such a great thing going. Like, could you roll the dice and see what this team could do? Maybe add one more piece on the edges and see what this team could do as currently constructed with this core of Tobias Harris, Maxi, and Joel Embiid and see just how far this group can go before you make a decision this summer. There's going to be options for them in the summer. They have a bunch of assets. Remember, they got two first-round picks from the Clippers. This team is going to have great, uh, I think, uh, ability to go add town if they want in the summer. It's, this is going to be a fun one. Lou, let me ask you if, you, if one team had to strengthen their roster more, would you think it was Denver or Philly? And you got to pick one. And I'm not, because, <laughs> because I feel... <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I feel like both of these teams, I, obviously any team that's trying to win a championship, they would love to strengthen their bench, give them an opportunity at the top of those second quarters uh, when your starters are out, you know, to either increase that lead or, or get a great plus minus situation going. But I, I like Reggie Jackson um, coming off the bench for Denver. You know, I like Christian Braun to get an opportunity to be a bigger part of what they're doing in Denver as well. He's getting a he's getting some quality minutes and getting a quality experience and learning what it's like to be on a championship caliber team. And on the flip side of that, you got a you got a Pat Bev and you got a Marcus Morris coming off the bench for the Philadelphia 76ers. I like that mix of guys that can hold it down for seven to eight minute stretches while 
you know, the, the, the starting groups are, are taking a break. And so would both of these teams like to get better on the bench? I'm sure. But at, at what cost and at what position? You know, the Sixers, you can throw that ball to Marcus Morris five or six times and he's going to give you a bucket. Who's going to be a better um, perimeter defender than, than Pat Bev? You know, Reggie Jackson has proven that he can go out and give you 25 to 30 points a game. Christian Braun plays with a lot of energy. So it's a lot of guys out there in the market that can strengthen both of these teams, but I don't see anything glaring for either one of them. It's a nice position to be in. Um, what about on the Philly side, the Maxi Harris and B 90 points combined last night? Do you envision this as a, a championship core? It is, but I, listen, that's going to that's gonna be tough to do consistently. You know, we're talking about one guy that had 40 and two other guys, 25-plus yeah. apiece. That's, it's, that's just going to be tough to keep up with, especially in the play, in playoffs. Somebody's going to get taken away. Somebody is going to get absolutely wiped out of this series, and the fans are going to go crazy. He's not playing well because they don't understand the tactics that comes with the playoffs. You know, in order for our team to beat you in a seven-game series, something has to be sacrificed, and you got to be, be willing to give up something. And so to expect these guys to play at such a high clip is unrealistic, but if they can pull it off, they're going to give themselves a real opportunity to be a championship contending team. Moving on to the West Coast, a late game last night. Thunder out in Los Angeles, this time taking on the Clippers. Man, this young squad, they, they're going up against a bunch of vets, and, and that's what happened in the final result, 128-117. But Paul George, he had 18 of his 38 points in the fourth quarter. So if you turn this one off early, yeah, you missed something. Um, if they need, if they want to contend for a title, and they obviously have one hell of a great roster, but do you need this version of Paul George every night, Lou? Absolutely. He's, he's the one guy out of the four that can absolutely just go clean out, get a bucket. You know, he pin downs, anything. Paul George has a deep, deep offensive bag. You know, when it comes to James Harden, he uses his ability to draw fouls. He has the step back. He's a great three-point shooter, great rim attacker. But when you're talking about just a natural-born, pure scorer, Paul George is, is the most natural guy on that team, and he's going to have to be the leading scorer, plain and simple. Even though I know the Clippers said that they need to play through, they need to play through James Harden, a lot of that play needs to be James Harden playing in two-man two -man game or looking for Paul George on pin downs when he's, when he's looking to be um, a pass first guard, you know, like he's been over the, over the course of the last 10 or so games. And so this is a great thing for the Clippers. Like I said, they got a lot of weapons, and I think PG is the most important one. It's crazy. Back in 19, he was traded uh, by the Thunder, the Clippers, and that was, of course, for SGA and a handful of first-round picks. I'm going to ask you who won the trade, but just remind everyone that Paul George has already answered that question when he said, in a way, OKC won that trade by getting the, uh, the future picks and a future MVP. What do you think, Lou? Yeah. Yeah, both sides. I think both sides won. I, I think short term, the Los Angeles Clippers, they are prepared to, they, they are equipped to win a championship before OKC. But long term, OKC, they have a lot of young guys and a lot of young assets on that basketball team that's going to give them the same ability for years to come. And so I think OKC, the, the moves that Sam Presti made and going to get SGA, I think he was thinking long term and I think the Clippers were looking short term and it's working out like that for both sides right now. I mean, he could not describe the two organizations better short term long term and oklahoma city has done that shams we already know Kawhi got his deal done now we wait for the next extension to fall will it be pg or harden it's it's gonna have to be paul george out of either of those two for a couple of reasons one there is optimism about about the clippers and, and paul george and he's wanted to play in la and you saw what Kawhi leonard signed three years 152.4 million dollars about eight and a half million dollars less than his maximum that he could have gotten for those three years. Uh, also, no player options. So, you know, could Paul George do a deal, basically the same deal that Kawhi Leonard deal uh, that Kawhi Leonard did? Could he do a deal that's just shy of that number that Kawhi Leonard signed for, but then maybe get a player option? I think these are going to be continued negotiations. I know the Clippers want to get a deal done. I think Paul George, uh, you know, by all accounts, wants to stay in L.A. as well. James Harden, on the other hand, he is not eligible for an extension, a new contract, until after the NBA season, after the NBA Finals. So, uh, you know, look for those conversations to take place after the NBA Finals are over. But th the Clippers didn't give up two first-round picks for him, just for him to walk in free agency. They want 
to retain him long term. James Harden clearly chose to be in L.A. He's back home. I think there is a mutual interest in getting a deal done, but that's going to have to take place after the NBA season closer to July. And um, the injury that happened or didn't happen last night, but it affected Zubats, of course, wasn't in the game. The calf, how long can we mm. expect him to be out? Just a massive blow. Four weeks at least for Avisa Zubac, and he's going to be out for the, the foreseeable future. And it's a massive blow for the front court, uh, for the Clippers. He's played such a vital role uh, this year for them. Uh, Zucci man, as, uh, as, as our guy Lou likes to call him, and Mason Plumley. He started last night. I think he's going to be the starter. But that's why you go get Daniel Tice. They got Daniel Tice. He agreed to a buyout with the Pacers earlier this year, and then they signed him. And then you, you look at the rotation. Zubac, you have... Uh, Tice, you have Plumlee. That's a lot of centers, but now with Zubac out, and he has dealt with calf injuries in the past, and so getting uh, Tice, I think, is going to be good for them, at least in the short term, as insurance. I mean, look, obviously it's not ideal, Lou, but then you watch the game last night, and, and Tice, and they seem to fill in just fine. Should we be even concerned too much? Yeah, this is, a, honestly, this is a major blow. You know, Zoo is one of those guys. He's a glue guy. You know, his, his impact goes unnoticed a lot of the times because he's such a quiet and reserved guy. And he's playing with, with four mega stars in this business and he can kind of get overshadowed. But he's given this team so much balance and, and depth at that five position that gives them an opportunity to win so many games. And so, you know, for me personally, that's my, that's my young boy. And I, I, I feel for him, he, you know, he has these injuries from time to time. And especially being a big guy in your calf, that's going to be something major uh, to deal with. And, and so... You know, hopefully Zoo gets well, gets well fast for this team and gets back on the floor. But this is this is going to be something to watch. Half injury sounds annoying um, on the Thunder side. Now we watch them lose both games out in Los Angeles, Lakers and Clippers back to back. I mean, they're a young team, so I, I don't know how much we want to pile on Lou. But what can they learn, I guess, from the two back to back losses? It's still a pecking order. <laughs> it's still a pecking order, you know, it's, it's, that, it's the little brother, big brother dynamic, you know, the OGs are holding it down. And, and trust me, the Lakers, are, they're watching, the Clippers are watching. They know that OKC is on fire and they're playing good basketball and they're a team to be reckoned with. So especially when they come into their building, these are statement games for, for these veteran groups, you know. And of course, the, the small, the little stories in these games, you know, the Clippers with the Paul George and the SGA trade, you know, the Lakers and hearing all of the talk about the young teams are coming and the <laughs> Lakers are getting older. You know, these are little sub stories that's a part of this. And so, you know, I think these were big statement games for both L.A. teams that, you know, we understand you guys are coming, but not yet. We, we still the top dogs around in the West. So this was good. This not good to see because I don't have a dog in any of these fights. But, mm -hmm. you know, it was it was clear cut that this these were very motivated basketball teams. They want it. They're sick of hearing about it. You know, it's you look OKC. We've gotten used to sort of they're on the slow burn track. But is there a world, Lou, where you could see them making some moves to speed up the process, or just continue as they've been doing and let this this group grow? Keep cooking, keep cooking. You got a great recipe right now. You know, you're getting a lot of great production from a lot of young players. Don't mess it up. You know, don't mess it up. Every team always wants to get better. And if something, if a Pascal Siakam becomes available in, in some fantasy world, sure, you give it a look and you, and you see if that's something that you can, you can add to your basketball team for years to come. But right now, how they're playing, I wouldn't bother with it at all. Allow these guys continue to grow and build together. And, you know, because chemistry is a big thing in this league. Mm. Once guys, they build chemistry and they love and they learn to play with each other, that's something that money can't buy. And that's something that you can't, that you can't add to your team. It's something that comes natural and is needed. And so having that with such a young core, I wouldn't bother with it at all. Taking a quick break. When we come back, puppies! A historic comeback is also, but really just puppies! When Run It Back returns. I'm the only one that cares. Run it all, run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it all, run it back, run it all, run it back, run it all. Well, this game was something. Uh, King Suns, they overcome, Phoenix does, a 22-point deficit in the fourth quarter. If you were flipping around, and you probably were, because I thought this thing was over, why bother? Um, but a comeback win like that for this Phoenix team, Lou, that has sort of been all over the place. Durant had his 27-5-4. and four. Not sure what to make of them yet. 
is this something you can build on, especially with a team of vets? And let's get back into this thing. Yeah, that team's sitting at sitting at eighth place. You know, these are these are much needed wins, especially going going into the All Star break in another couple of weeks. You know, this they you're gonna want to pick up some momentum going into that break, and so this is one of those games that can kind of give you that lift and and give some credit to the unsung hero. Grayson Allen played out of his mind last night, nine for fourteen from the three point line. You know, he's gonna be somewhat of a, a, a Steve Kerr type player for this group. You know, when you have so much talent. You need somebody to take the pressure off of the big three, especially when, when shots are not falling, you know, for a couple of those guys like they weren't last night. You know, they didn't play their best basketball. But, you know, they got the personnel to, if any team is going to come back from 22 down in the fourth quarter, give me a team with Kevin Durant, Brad Beal, <laughs> and, Devin, and, and, and Devin Booker. And, and if Grayson Allen's going to shoot the ball like that, uh, if I'm his teammate, I'm telling him, we need you shooting the ball like that every single night to give us chances to win basketball games. So this is a big win for them, big motivation, big swing on, on, on energy. And so this is something they can build off of. Yeah, NBA is crazy. These, these types of runs are insane to me, especially when it all comes down to the fourth quarter. But on the other side, you have a Kings team, a young Kings team that is looking to make some waves, um, and then they lose a game in this manner. How do you throw this one away and, and forget about it, Lou? Just that. You know, obviously, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a long film session uh, in, in the Kings facility today, just going over what went wrong, things that they could have done better. But you got to have a short memory. You got to have a short memory, uh, memory loss when it comes to things like this. Just get over it. It's a bad night. It was a bad quarter. Came down to <laughs> a bad quarter. I thought they were playing pretty good basketball up until that point. So you throw it away. You don't overreact and you just keep moving forward in the season. Yeah, it was a really bad quarter. I, I thought the game was over, Shams. Uh, what were some of your takeaways? Grayson Allen. I mean, he's gone to Phoenix, and he's been this the steal really of that trade that that the that the Suns had with the with the Blazers, with the Bucks, getting him from Milwaukee. I mean, nine three pointers, tying a franchise record. Kevin Durant. We saw what he did down the stretch, uh, hitting clutch shots, making clutch passes. Even though Devin Booker, sixteen and eleven. Um, and Brad Beal didn't shoot the ball great, but um, I think being able to have Grace now and play such a vital role to this team, uh, you, you have to give him a lot of credit. Uh, this this Suns team, they're starting to tack, tack together wins, and every single time this big three is able to play together, get chemistry, that's what this, this organization has been waiting for. They want to see this team in full, and we've seen it now for a stretch of about a couple weeks. Let me ask a question. Is, is it me, or is Grace and Allen slightly more likable as a member of this team versus his last, Lou. You can say no. Mm. <laughs> nah. you, you want okay, good. Let's just move on then. Um, right I will now, say he's thing... playing a different role, right? Like, like he, is. He, he has the ball in his hands more. Um, he's playing more like I don't know, Kyle Korver esque, like where he's he's spotting up, he's shooting, he's coming off curls. Like he's not playing that enforcer role at, at times. That yeah. you know, that, that defender. Um, kind of just that random spot up shooter, um, you know, role that he was playing in Milwaukee or Memphis before that. Like he, he has a legitimate role. You remember the Kyle Corver days mm -hmm. in Atlanta, like they were designing plays for him and that's similar to what Grayson Allen's doing now. Yeah. I don't feel like yelling at my TV like I used to. And I think that's growth, uh, for all of us right now, the Sacramento Kings are in the five spot Phoenix in the what seven. Oh, Kings are in the seven Suns are in the eight. Who's finishing ahead. Lou. I still like Sacramento. I, I think I think Phoenix okay. is going to make up some ground here, but I, I I think Sacramento still stays on the pace that they're on. I think they still finish higher. Uh, that's a big that's a big thing to say. I look all of this was me wasting time to get to one piece of video that I want. Uh, I don't care if you guys don't like it, but it's puppies. And anytime we get puppies at halftime, the world wins. Roll that beautiful bean footage for the love of everything. Yes. Oh God, so cute. Puppies. So cute. I mean, Shams, have you ever had a dog? I haven't had a dog, but I, dogs are starting to war, uh, grow on me. Uh, they're they're wearing on me for sure. So I, I that I, bulldog. I, I, I've come a long. I've come a long way. I used to be scared I have of dogs. To no, don't be scared of dogs, Shams. I'm just stick with me, kid. Uh, I will get you to love dogs more than people, actually, probably. I'm assuming these guys were up for adoption because usually that's what they're doing. And if so, it's a good thing I don't live there because they would all be here right now. Lou, is this warming your heart like it is mine? 
It's fun. I, I, I caught the dog bug about five or six years ago. I, yeah. I, I have two Shiba news myself. And so um, I'm a dog lover now. I'm part of the community. Once you're part of the community, you can't leave. I, I can't get over the bulldog, by the way, um, that you don't normally see one of those guys. What's this guy doing? Monkey. <laughs> Wait, is he going to do so? Yes. Hey, when you got to go, you got to go. And he's going. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, we're, we're doing it that. Took, all right. took, well, I mean, he does, he's, first of all, he's a puppy. It, it blended Secondly, in with the court at first. It, it really did. That could have been a disaster. Um, he's excited. He's nervous. He's scared. And he's a puppy. And I loved it. All right. We're going to take a, a quick break right now. When we come back, more scoops back, from Shams. Up, this is Run It Back. 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 Sham scoops time. All right, Indianapolis All Star Game weekend. Are we going to see Wimby one way or the other, Shams? I, I hope this news warmed your heart. I'm told, Michelle, that Victor Wembanyama has committed to the Skills Challenge at All Star Weekend on Saturday night. Seven foot four big man. This is going to be a one of a kind Skills ch Challenge. Clearly, <laughs> with with Wimby in it. Um, I'm told there, he could be a part of a team, a skills challenge team of all number one picks. Not sure who the other contestants are, Ooh. but Victor Wembanyama is planning to be one of them. What do you feel about this, Michelle? Are you are you going to be more excited to watch Saturday night than you usually are? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I I watch it anyways, even on the years when we sort of slam it and say it was boring. I'm still watching. I mean, how else can you have the opinion it was boring? But Yes, this excites me more. And then I'm thinking skills, dunk. Wouldn't, don't we want to see him in the dunk contest, Lou? I mean, that that would be something. I'll pass. You know, he, I, I don't, I, I haven't seen him do any, like, really impressive dunks, so to speak. You know, I think it's going to be too easy for him. He's not half the dunks. So, like, I don't, I don't know if we'll be entertained by that. You know what I mean? And so I would. I would rather see him. I would much rather see him in a skills competition than a dunk contest. It's going to look so weird. You're right, Sean. Like a 7 4, whatever, in the skills is just, it's going to look odd. It still looks odd to me when he's in games and he just pulls up and, and drills a three. But that being said, um, we're always trying to fix everything. When are we getting our one on one skills tournament situation, Lou? And how great would that be as an addition to All Star Weekend? I think it'd be fun. I think it'd be fun and innovative, but it'll never happen. You know, <laughs> one, you got to deal with guys. L look, when you're playing a team sport, you can kind of hide. One on one on one is different. You get some trash talk going, and you get these get these juices flowing. You're gonna get a completely different environment than you anticipated. You know, you're gonna get a sneak peek into how extremely extremely competitive guys are. So you're gonna start dealing with some trash talk, some pushing, some shoving, oh, maybe some yes. injuries here and there, maybe some guys getting clothesline. The NBA has to protect the product. We would never see this happen. <laughs> Ever? God, the way you described it made it even better than in my mind. Two dribble, one on one. Right now you pick who's winning. Two dribbles right now? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh give me Kevin Durant. Kevin like Durant. It. Ooh, that's a smooth. Just off pick. The, yeah, off the top of my head. Like a beautiful yeah. dance. I'd watch that. I, I, you say never. I say never say never. Um, we're going to hold on to that hope. Shams, we also had some news on Jay Crowder, and this seemed to be hopefully heading in a positive direction. Jay Crowder cleared to return tonight for Milwaukee. He will be playing in the lineup uh, against the Cavaliers in Cleveland. He's missed the last Ooh. two months. He had core muscle surgery. Uh, he's been ramping up, getting ready to play. This is a guy that was top four in the on the team in minutes per game. He was shooting 53% from, from three-point range before his injury. When you think about the recipe that helped Milwaukee win a championship a couple years ago, having an enforcer, having a guy that can play multiple positions, defend multiple positions, and P.J. Tucker, that's really the role they set out for Jay Crowder coming off the bench, starting, guarding, being versatile, and, and having him back in the lineup tonight will allow this team to be uh, much more whole moving forward. That's a huge, huge uh, return. And and we got more scoop, Sean. It's a lot of scoop today. Adam Silver out on the West Coast yesterday talking a little all-star of the future. What was that news? The Clippers will be getting the 2026 all-star weekend at their new arena into a dome. 
Steve Ballmer's baby. He's been he's been working on building this new arena for a while. Lou, Lou Will might have more information on this arena than I do, but uh, this is something that Steve Ballmer, that Clippers organization, has been has been working on for the last several years, and it's going to open in August this year, and they're going to play in this new arena next season, and then host the 2026 All Star Weekend. As a former Clipper great, Lou Will, what do you think about the Clippers yeah. getting All Star Weekend? I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to be great. I, I remember sitting in those meetings and Steve Ballmer showing us renderings of the of the arena and telling us about all of the different ideas that he had. You know, the 2000, 2000 toilets. He doesn't he doesn't want anybody waiting in line for the bathrooms <laughs> and so many uh, so many concession stands and, and having standing only seats to have that college environment. You know, this arena is built for basketball. It's it is built four great environments and so I look forward to I look forward to the Clippers open this up next year uh, all-star weekend is going to be great but you know this is something that Steve Ballmer has been talking about he's super proud of it um, I, I was slightly a part of you know this thing when it was an idea that was coming into fruition and so I'm, I'm excited for the Clippers organization and having their own piece of land and having their own you know place to stay and that somewhere that they can call home instead of sharing it yes. and it's always feeling like the B team in LA you know finally they have you know their own situation Clippers getting their own arena that I mean that it's is huge. a game changer in the in, in the NBA and we're gonna see it finally. next season like like Lou said Lou was there at the beginning of it I mean when Steve Ballmer bought yeah. the team and 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 all that so I mean I'm sure you you've got to have a little bit of pride in you Lou right now I was also going to say, Lou, you should get it where we do live shows from the brand new arena, seeing as you can host us and give us the tour and all that good stuff. Can you tell me about the wall? Because uh, that was something that came out and, and there are weird rules or fun rules for this wall. Um, here it is. Oh. Section 51, uninterrupted rows of fans. You cannot cheer for the opposing team. You cannot wear opponent gear, and the tickets can only be resold in Clippers Marketplace, which, P.S., I do like that. A season on the wall will cost you anywhere from 5 to 25 k You know what? As much as we think Ballmer's kind of a wackadoo in, like, all the good ways, he really gets it. Like, he is a fan of that. Those are rules that I would want to put in play, Shams, if I had the money to own something like that. It's, it's, I get mad when I see opposing fans in, in other arenas. Do we love this? Lou, you love it? I think I think it's an amazing idea. Lou, were you responsible for this? Yeah. I want to know. <laughs> this was your idea? No, I, I no, this is this is my first time hearing about it, but I will say Steve Ballmer being an innovator, he's trying to figure out so many different ways to give his team the <laughs> the 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 the, the op opportunity to have an edge on other teams that's coming into to their arena. And so, listen, he's drawing a line. Y'all want to sit in these seats? No opposing teams. This is our crowd. This is our home. And this is our standard. And, and so I, I'm, I'm digging it. I like it. You know what they didn't tell us is what happens to someone who tries to sneak in. I don't know if they get tased or what, but uh, the jersey of the opposing team. <laughs> like you just get escorted out. That's I'm pretty I sure you're going to be escorted out or <laughs> escorted into a, a, a neutral area. <laughs> this is awesome. I can't wait for this to happen. Um, we got a lot of gems from Steve Ballmer. We got one last night. Take a listen stay in your seat or get up you get up we're gonna know that you stood up as long as you you want us to you've got to give us the permission we'll know that you get up we know that you cheer we know how loudly you cheer if you're if you're good on those things we can give you a little discounts around the shop just to to reinforce that excellent behavior that we we want and need of our fans to make this thing rocking i mean look our fans have a role to play with our team this isn't just for the fans to enjoy the experience. If our he's uh, dead serious, and, he, and listen, he means it. He means it. I remember, Ooh. I remember sitting in meetings with him, and he says, "Listen, I'm not much of a basketball guy. What what I can do, I can be the L.A. Clippers' number one biggest fan." And I can set an example about how I cheer this team on and how I motivate this crowd. And you've, you've seen that throughout the years of him being excited courtside and, and the motivation that he's given these teams. And so he wants that to be loud. He wants that to be proud. And he, it starts with him. And so, I, listen, I've never seen an owner so excited about something and, and, and be so serious about it. And so, I, I'm, like I said, I'm digging this.
I wish I would have gotten discounts for all the times I cheered. That's kind of a brilliant idea. Where does he rank on your list of owners, Lou? Clearly one of my favorites. Um, Steve, is, Steve was very fair to me, very honest. And, and when we didn't agree on certain things, he was honest, looked me in my eyes and told me what he disagreed with. Um, and, and a very, very fair man. And so he's, he's one of my favorites for sure. Love Steve. I can't wait for this new building. It's going to be a blast. We're going to take a still quick break. And they still cut me floor seats. So hopefully I get the same treatment in the, in the new arena. So much And love. Chandler wants to go and Shams <laughs> wants to go. So make it happen. Um, I'll go if you want me to. We'll take a break. For we'll sure. run it back when we return. Got a few minutes left here in show. We want to preview the game tonight, Mavs Lakers. Right now, uh, the Mavs have beaten them twice already this season, but both those games were determined by three points or less. The spread tonight, three and a half point favorites, leaning Lakers. Lou, you buying that? Yeah, Lakers always get the Lakers always get the spread when they're at home. You know, they're a pretty good basketball team on their home floor, and you know, coming off a big win against those young guys. They're going to try to get another big win against another group of really, really talented superstar young guys. And so I look forward to this matchup. This will be one that I'll watch tonight. Hopefully we see the superstars be superstars and we get a really, really good entertaining basketball game. Shams, what are you looking out for? Anytime you can see Kyrie Irving against LeBron James, you have to sign up. So I, I enjoy seeing those two guys play each other. Luka Doncic, I think, was listed questionable. We'll see if he plays. Um, but I mean, anytime you see Luca, Kyrie, LeBron, AD on the same court, you have to, you have to tune in. It's always funny. The Clippers game followed by a Lakers game the next night. The people watching could not be more different between those two things. And I hope the new building makes it more interesting, Lou. I, I meant to ask you about that. I want it to be Lakers-esque in its ridiculousness. Do you have any say in that? No. Fine. That's going to do it. No, it's like, I don't know. Out, so I didn't, do I didn't even us. hear you, so we can go. <laughs> Great. <laughs> we'll be back run tomorrow. Back, up, Enjoy your Wednesday. Run it up, run it back, 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 run it up, run it up, run it back, yeah, yeah.